I want to thank uh, the staff, uh, the students, uh, the organizers of this event uh, uh, for inviting me here with a special uh, acknowledgement of Malcolm Lesser who phoned me some months ago and uh, uh, invited me to be here. So uh, thank you very much and I've been given a, a large, uh, wonderful and timely uh, topic to speak about, uh, renewable energy, sustainable resources and trade. That covers a lot of ground so I'm going to uh, break it down into a few uh, components and talk briefly on, on each and then we'll leave lots of time for, for questions and, and discussion and disagreements and whatever you might, uh, might have. So uh, as was pointed out by some of the earlier speakers and I'm thinking particularly of, uh, of Lauren Scott and, uh, and uh, Mr. Kawa and others, uh, the, we face some serious uh, problems and challenges in the management of our resources. Uh, we have some real opportunities and potential for a different way to proceed and more positive approaches and today I'd like to uh, look at some of the problems uh, briefly that we're facing and then uh, walk through uh, some what I see as some of the possible solutions and then uh, have a discussion. I'll start uh, briefly with forestry. Canada is a huge country. We've got a land area of over 9 million square kilometers and almost half of that is covered with forest. It's one of our largest industries. We have over 30 species of conifers, over 100 species of deciduous or hardwood trees and 80% of our forest is, as you uh, are well aware, I'm sure, is boreal. But most forest land, as was pointed out uh, earlier, in Canada is publicly owned, but our record of management of the resource has not been good. Huge areas have been clear-cut, some have been replanted, much has not. We face serious problems of overcutting, sheer waste and destruction, uh, from harvesting, from the pollution from the pulp mills right through to landfills that are filled with newspaper and cardboard and other valuable uh, paper products. And because of the crucial role of forests in maintaining life on the planet, debate has raged over industrial uh, forestry. The logging practices, this debate has ranged from blockades in northern Saskatchewan uh, where I was arrested and spent a night in jail in 1992 supporting the Aboriginal, the longest running blockade of uh, uh, running at that time in Canada. And then of course mass arrests in Clackwood Sound uh, to protests in the Amazon uh, rainforest. Now there's a push by the United States of course to privatize Canadian forests. That was alluded to in one of the earlier presentations here today. That's the main thrust behind this whole softwood lumber uh, deal. You've seen the continuous harassment since the mid-1980s of our forest industry from the US industry. What they want is privatization of our forests and that's what they're, they're driving for. But it doesn't have to be this way. The forest industry could and in my view must become a model of sustainable and renewable development, not handed over to US and other forest giants, and not clear-cut. European countries have taken the lead in this. Switzerland, for example, banned clear-cutting 300 years ago. And the Swiss forest today is, uh, has to be seen to be appreciated. I can just tell a little story. There's a group of Canadian uh, forest executives who were, who were touring in Switzerland, visiting one of uh, Switzerland's major cities. The mayor took them up on the lift to show them their forest. They looked all around. They said, but where's the logging going on? And the mayor said, well, first we sell our forests a thousand times to the tourists before we touch them. And then when we do touch them, we selectively cut. And then they had to look through the binoculars to see where the logging was going on because they were selectively cutting the trees out and leaving the entire canopy uh, looking the same as it always had. So that's the way they're handling their forest uh, uh, practices. You contrast that to what we see here when you fly over uh, whole parts of Canada, it's enough to, to make you weep. So, closer to home, the model, we have a, the longest running, the oldest eco-forest in North America at Yellow Point on Vancouver Island. I don't know if any of you have ever had a chance to learn of that wonderful operation uh, or hear of the man who runs it, Merv Wilkinson, uh, who is now in his early 90s. He bought the forest in 1939. He has more timber in his forest today than when he bought it. Some of his trees are 1,500 years old, some 1,800 years old. He's got a couple that are 2,000 years old. The Haida come to him when they want to create one of their major uh, dugout canoes. And he has a minimum, the logging trails, of course, he has no damaging logging trails. He has minimum imp impact trails, selective cutting only, no replanting. He hasn't planted a tree since 1939. 
because he allows the natural regeneration uh, to do its, uh, do its work. And some of his trees, he leaves them as seed trees uh, that, uh, for particular, particular traits, but the squirrels and the birds, of course, uh, do, their, do their work there. And all of the canopy, the wildlife habitat, remains intact. And he's made a good living all the while doing this. Uh, when I built, uh, built a log house on my farm at Borden on the 100th anniversary of our farm a few years ago, uh, Merv uh, mentored me through the whole project. I had some trees that, that had been planted by my grandfather, evergreen trees in 1907. They died in the drought a few years ago, and he told me, those are your perfect trees for your log house. Let them, let them uh, dry standing and then cut them down. It uh, turned out to, to be a, a wonderful uh, project that he mentored throughout. But if you ever want to take a class project to one of the masters of the art of forestry, Merv Wilkinson in Yellow Point, he hosts people from all over the world, some 3,000 visitors uh, through his eco-forest uh, a year, but he's largely unknown uh, in Canada. I want to turn to agriculture. Agriculture is one of the largest industries on the prairies, and it has to be renewable by definition or human life on this planet is going to cease. Yet the model of industrial agriculture that we're following and increasingly adapting is, along with a host of other problems, completely unsustainable, relying as it does on massive inputs of non-renewable petroleum-based fertilizers, pesticides, and fuels. And the effort, of course, to move to biofuels is not going to solve this problem. It brings another whole series of challenges with it, perhaps the most significant being the use of crops and croplands to produce vehicle fuel while almost a billion people on the planet don't have enough to eat. A recent book you might have uh, uh, heard about which is worth reading is called Stuffed and Starved which looks at how almost a billion people uh, don't have enough to eat and yet over 500 million are obese or overweight on the other end of the scale. So this is the kind of situation that we're, we are creating on our planet. One of the alternatives to chemical based agriculture is organic agriculture which does not use chemicals or poison fertilizers or pesticides. As was mentioned, uh, I, I farmed 2,700 acres. We converted our farm over to organic operation in 1975. At that time it was regarded as a little a bit of a fringe thing to do. People said, oh it's just a fad, it won't, it won't last. Uh, uh, and I think there were a half a dozen of us uh, uh, trying to do it at least uh, openly at that time. But this is now my 34th year, and over this time, organics has grown rapidly to become probably the fastest growing sector of agriculture. Again, many European countries are in the lead, some with government set goals to convert and accelerate the transition to sustainable and organic farming. Some of you might have seen when the German Ag Minister and the Environment Minister cooked their meal together of organic food and urged all of Germany's farmers to move uh, towards organic. So this is the way of the future. What moved me and started me thinking was, as with most men, there was a, a woman in my life and it was Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. And uh, Rachel Carson, of course, was the wonderful American writer. I read her book as a university student in the late 60s and was a life-changing experience for me. She pointed out how the many of the pesticides and herbicides that we now use so freely had their origins as biological warfare agents developed originally uh, by the Nazi German war machine and then converted to so-called peaceful use and now they're sprayed across our planet with great abandon. In her book she talks about how in 1900 one in ten North Americans developed cancer. 